Welcome to Lecture 2.2, Applications of the Rank Nullity Theorem. In the last lecture, we learned about a fundamental result of linear maps, aptly called the Rank Nullity Theorem. This says that if t is a linear map from x to u, then the dimension of the range, which is called the rank, plus the dimension of the null space, which is called the nullity, is the dimension of x. Now remember that the range lives in u and the null space lives in x. In this lecture, we will show how this very theoretical result about vector spaces has some surprising implications involving roots of polynomials, differential equations, and partial differential equations. We will also use the following simple corollary from the previous lecture that I will continue to refer to as corollary B. This says, suppose that x and u have the same dimension, and it's actually implied that this is finite dimensional, I should mention that. And additionally, the null space is just the zero vector. Then the range of t is all of u, or equivalently, t is bijective. Okay, let's get started. We'll begin with polynomial interpolation. Let x be the vector space of polynomials over the complex numbers with degree less than n, and u be c to the n, so all n tuples of complex numbers. Both of these are n-dimensional vector spaces over c, and therefore they are isomorphic. Let's pick any distinct n complex numbers, s1 up to sn, and define the following linear map from x to u. We take a polynomial p of x and we plug in each of these numbers and consider that n-tuple. So it sends the polynomial to the n-tuple of these evaluations. Now we know both of these are n-dimensional spaces. So let's suppose that t applied to some polynomial is zero. That means that the image is the zero vector. So all of these entries have to be equal to zero. And this is impossible because p has degree at most n minus one. So it has at most n minus one distinct roots. Therefore, the null space of this linear map is just the zero polynomial. And so corollary B implies that the range is all of U, or equivalently, this map is bijective. Now, it's a little bit weird to think about complex valued polynomials because we can't really graph them in the traditional sense. But I think if I do an example using real valued polynomials, then I think the intuition and the motivation becomes clear. So let me pick three numbers. Let's pick one, two, and three just to make things easier. So let's say s1 equals one, s2 equals two, and s3 equals three. And what this is really saying is that every polynomial of degree less than or equal to, in this case, two, or less than three, is uniquely determined by its values on these three points. In other words, if I pick any three um, numbers in the xy plane, let's let's say let's this number and and let's say zero here and let's say this thing here. So if I pick these three numbers, there is a unique polynomial of degree less than three that goes through these numbers. So you can sort of guess what that you can sort of in, Guess what that is? This is what polynomial interpolation is. It's saying three points determines a polynomial of degree less than three. Now, it doesn't have to be a parabola. If these three points were on a line, straight line, it would be a linear function. Or if they were on a flat line, it would be a, a degree, a constant function. So let's just do one more example. So let me once again pick some, some points. Let's just say, I don't know, one, three, five, six, seven. And let me put this, 
And I'm just going to make this up as I go along. And so here we have n, n equals 5. So there is a unique degree 4 polynomial that goes through these, or 4 or less polynomial. I think I made it general enough that it's going to have to be a degree 4 polynomial. Um, and I'm probably pretty bad at drawing this. So maybe I should have thought about this. Um, let's see. So I made this so this is a little bit concave this way. So I don't think it's going to... So I think it's going to have to do something like... Th this example... Oh, I'm probably really bad at this. It'd probably have to be something like, like this. But there's one and only one because there's a bijective correspondence between the space of polynomials, and the space of this, in this case, five tuples of points, of input and out. So these are the fixed input values, and the heights are the fixed output values. I think that's really neat. This is a very deep result on polynomials that falls, that basically falls out from this very simple rank nullity theorem. Let's do one more deep result about polynomials. Let x be the space of polynomials of degree less than n. So almost the same as the previous slide, except we'll do it over r instead of over c. And let u be r to the n. So once again, these are n-dimensional vector spaces, but this time over r. And let's pick n pairwise disjoint intervals. So if this is the real line, then maybe this is I1, maybe this is I2, this is I3, and maybe I4, something like that. From calculus, we know that the average value of a polynomial over an interval is just its integral divided by the length of that interval. Let's define a linear function t that takes in a polynomial and it outputs an n-tuple consisting of the average value of that polynomial over the corresponding interval. And let's suppose that some polynomial p gets sent to zero. So that means that we have a polynomial of degree less than n whose average value is zero over n disjoint intervals. Now, it follows from the mean value theorem in calculus that such a p must have a root in each of these intervals. So if I want to draw a picture, suppose this is i, j, and we got some unknown function, but what we do know about it is that it has an average value of 0 on this interval. So that means that this signed area cancels with this Side area. So it has to have at least one root. But this would imply that our polynomial P, which is in the null space, has n distinct roots, which is impossible. In other words, if I have, let's suppose, this is an example, four distinct intervals, drawn like this. Call this i1, i2, i3, and i4, then any polynomial in the null space is going to have to have a root in here. So, so what we know is that it's a polynomial and it its average value is zero over all three or all four of these intervals. So it's going to have to have a root, but that's impossible because the degree of p is less than n, in this case less than 4. So there's no way that a degree 3 or less polynomial is going to have 4 roots. So we conclude that, I should probably write this down, that the range, by corollary b, the range of t is equal to u, which is r the n, and therefore t is bijective. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us, like we concluded in the previous slide, that there's that every n-tuple here, 
corresponds to a unique polynomial over here. In other words, if I take four intervals, as before, let me just draw them again. They don't have to be the same, but I'll make them one, two, three, four. So I went up to I4. And if I specify the average value of a function on all four of these intervals, so if I say, well, let, let's take a function whose average value is, is two on here, negative one on here, four on here, and five on here, then there's gonna be a unique polynomial of degree less than four that satisfies this. Now, I, I don't know how hard of a challenge I have given myself to, to draw such a thing, but let's see if I can do it. So that, so we get a polynomial of degree three, or less, it's probably gonna be degree three, and it's gonna have large, small absolute, so it's gonna be below the axis here, and then it's gonna be above the axis here. So, so this might take me a few tries. Maybe I should have prepared this. Um, what if we do something like, like this? I don't know, something that's probably, a it's probably not that accurate, but I think you get the idea that there, there's gonna be one and only one polynomial whose average value is exactly what we specify on each of these intervals. And that's a remarkable result that we can do this. That you can just pick any numbers out of the hat and put them here and you can find one and only one polynomial. And it follows without much work from the very simple rank nullity theorem. So hopefully I've impressed upon you how powerful it is to look at a framework of linear maps without matrices, just you get these simple transparent proofs that have some very deep results about seemingly unrelated fields. In this case, very nonlinear functions, namely polynomials. Our last two examples will involve differential equations, both ordinary and partial. And they will also follow from an application of corollary B that we did in the previous lecture. So please go back and watch that if you haven't, but let me quickly recap that. That said that if we have a linear map T from X to U, two spaces that have the same dimension, actually in this case, they're both Rn, and we have a system of equations, so N variables and, and unknowns, then if the related homogeneous system has only the trivial solution, so in other words, if Tx equals zero has only the trivial solution, meaning the null space of T is just the zero vector, then this original system, which is Tx equals U, only has one solution. So this having the trivial solution, equivalently one solution is equivalent to this inhomogeneous system having a unique solution. Okay, so we're gonna apply that in the world of differential equations. We'll start with something which is taught in almost any intro ODEs course, the method of undetermined coefficients. This is a method that can be applied to solve a second order linear inhomogeneous equation. So the left-hand side, something like this, where typically A, B, and C are constants. And then the right-hand side is, is called the forcing term. Now, one of the big themes in any ODEs course is that the general solution of such an equation has the following form. Y of t equals yh of t plus yp of t. Here, yh of t is the general solution to the related homogeneous equation. So just take this ODE above and make the forcing term zero. So in linear algebra terms, that means it is the null space of the linear operator. So in this case, the one that sends y to ay double prime plus by prime plus cy. So, so really I mean L is equal to a d squared dt squared plus b d dt plus c. So that's how you solve the, the general solution. Um, now the homogeneous solution is 
is, is a whole different method of how to solve that. It's actually if assuming a, b, and c are constants, you assume that there is a solution of the form e to the r t. And the reason why is because if you look at this this equation down here, let me let me box it. So if you look at this equation down here, um, all derivatives of this function are also exponential functions, but constants pull out. So if, if you plug this into the left-hand side, then you're going to get a whole bunch. What you're going to get is some number of e to the rt's equaling zero. And if you pick the coefficient, if you pick for the right choice of r, this constant is, in theory, is going to be zero. Now there, there's several case. Well, so let me say a little bit more about this, um, just because we're so close. So if you plug this in, what's going to happen is is you're going to get an e to the rt in all three of these terms. So you can factor that out, and then you get a r squared plus b r plus c equals zero. And so um, here is a second um, here's a second degree polynomial, and let me, I didn't organize this too well. So R is going to be um, negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC over 2A. So this is R1 and, and R2. Now there's three cases. If these are distinct real numbers, then you have two exponential functions that are not scalars of each other. And th so you have two solutions. And I should say, because it's a second order, um, the solution space is going to be two-dimensional. That's a basic theorem of linear differential equations. So if, if these are distinct real, you get your two solutions. If they are, if, if you get repeated roots, then it's a little trickier. You, gotta, you only have one solution, so you got to find a second one. And as a spoiler, if you take this guy and you stick a T in front, that'll work. Then the third case is when these are complex. In that case, you still have two solutions, E to the R, 1t and e to the r 2t, but they're complex numbers and we like to write them as sines and cosines. And if we do that, we can always write such a function um, like, uh, like this down here. Um, and, and I won't get into the details, but this, in this case, this 3 and this 4 come from the, the real and the imaginary part. And, and actually, you know, I, I can say that if um, just just because again we are so close. If, if r equals alpha plus beta i, then we get solutions of the form e to the alpha t times. I gotta be careful. I don't reuse letters. A cosine of beta t plus b sine of beta t. So here, alpha and beta are fixed, and a and b are. Think of it like C1 and C2 are any, any constants. Okay, so where are we now? So with the forcing term, um, let's assume that the forcing term does not solve the homogeneous equation. That, that in theory, it could happen, but it will happen with a probability zero. It's a very rare event. So assuming that A, B, and C are such that um, the roots of this do not give this as a solution, then what you learn in an ODE's course is that you can always find a particular solution of the following form. So big A e to the 3t cosine of 4t plus big B e to the 3c, um, 3t sine of 4t. So basically, if you got a cos... So the general theme is you look for a forcing term that has the same form as... Or, or you look for a, for a particular solution that has the same form as the forcing term. But if you got a cosine, you got to include a sine because as you take derivatives of this and you plug it back in, you'll get sines and cosines and you gotta make both of them cancel out. So this, so th that's really the only motivation that you get is, well, yeah, you know, it works. If you take this and you plug it back in, you get sines and cosines. And this thing on the right is really five times this term plus zero times e to the three t sine. So you have to set the, the sine. So in, what you end up getting when you plug this into the left hand, or when you plug this in the left hand side, you get a whole something um, times e to the three t cosine of four t plus something else e to the three t sine of four t, and you have to set that equal to the right hand side, which is five e to the three t cosine of four t plus zero e to the three t sine of four t. So you get 
So you got to set this thing equal to five and you got to set this thing equal to zero and you get a system of two equations, algebraic equations, and two unknowns, capital A and capital B, and it works. So that's, that's nice that it works, but it doesn't really tell us theoretically, you know, holistically, why it works. And that, that's what I'm going to answer right now. Okay, so why does this work? So first of all, I'm going to let x be the span of the functions e to the 3t cosine 4t and e to the 3t sine of 4t. So this is a, a two-dimensional vector space. You can think of it like, like this. You know, here, here are those two functions that I've highlighted right there. Now, assuming that forcing term does not solve the left-hand side, which is our assumption, and when that does happen, there's more hoops you got to jump through. Then the only solution to the homogeneous equation Ly equals zero in this two-dimensional space is the zero function. So we can, in other words, we can look at this differential equation or this linear operator and say, what's the null space of this restricted to this space? And that's just the zero vector or the zero function. Now, what we are trying to do is not actually solve Ly equals zero in this space, but we're trying to solve Ly equals f for this particular f up here, because this forcing term is in this space. And th that's what we are trying to solve. By example b from corollary b, because the null space is of this linear operator on this two dimensional space is trivial, then there is a unique vector in this space. Let's call it yp for a particular solution that satisfies lyp equals f. So, in other words, we know that there will always be a unique function of this form because this is an x that solves this differential equation. And by our theory of linear differential equations, that's all that we need, a single particular solution. And this is why it exists and is unique. Our last example comes from the field of partial differential equations, which are the multivariate counterpart of ordinary differential equations. And they involve partial derivatives. This this is a much more complicated setting, and typically PDEs are too hard to solve explicitly, especially nonlinear ones. But there are three linear PDEs that are a lot more common because they come up in modeling. So these are ut equals c squared times the Laplacian of u, or for c is some constant, u t t equals c squared times Laplacian of u. I should say that this is the heat equation. This is the wave equation. And then the other one is where uh, Laplacian of u is zero. So you could put a c squared in there if you want, but it's not really necessary. So this is called Laplace's equation. And let me say a couple things about this. So first of all, this triangle, uh, Laplacian of u, in, um, in polar coordinates, sorry, in, in Cartesian coordinates, it's just the sum of the second derivatives. So it's, um, it's in a 2D space, uxx plus uyy. And you can see what it is in three dimensions or one dimension. Now, the heat equation just says, well, I should say that u is a function of, of x, y, and t. So the heat equation is going to model the temperature in like a square region where one of these directions is, well, is x and the other direction is, is y. The wave equation is going to model. Um, so imagine this thing being like some a trampoline and it's vibrating up and down. That's going to be what the wave equation models, the displacement. And then Laplace, Laplace's equation, uh, to understand what this means is if you think about the heat equation, then over time, heat is going to dissipate. So if, if you fix the boundary of this to be non-zero, so imagine this is like a factory, and, and heat does not escape 
um, up or down. It only escapes through the windows. And along the, so along the edges, there are, are heaters or windows. And so, and so maybe um, it, it's zero degrees on these three sides, but, but maybe that this back side, there, there's a heater in the middle. So the temperature along the back side is, is hottest in here, and it, and it looks like this. So um, what's going to happen over time? It doesn't really matter what the initial temperature distribution is. Over time, that's going to spread out. And, and let me actually redraw this now. So over time, that's going to spread out, and, and the temperature is going to be as dissipated or as flat as possible. So imagine that you build this thing out of wire, and you stick it into a bucket of, of soap, or maybe you take some plastic wrap and you stretch it um, across here to make a, a, a surface as minimal as possible, as flat as possible. That is what the solution is going to look like. So, so the, the, steady, the steady state solution to the heat equation is going to be this so-called minimal surface. And if you think about what steady state means, steady state means that u t equals zero, no longer changing. So if you take the heat equation and you set the left-hand side equal to zero, you get Laplace's equation. So in other words, Laplace's equation models these so-called minimal surfaces, the solutions to the, um, or I should say steady state solutions to the heat equation. For other examples, if I don't know how well I'm going to be drawing this. Um, so one classic example of such a, a solution is u of x, y equals, what is it, x, x squared minus y squared. So some sort of saddle. And you can imagine that if, if you take it like a cookie cutter and you cut out any sort of piece here, that it's going to look sort of like this, that the, the maximum and minimum values are going to be on the boundary and it's going to be as flat as possible. There's no local mins or local maxes, no matter how you take your, your little knife and cut out a chunk. Okay, so that's a little background for what Laplace's equation is. Think of it as like these soap bubble solutions or better yet as steady state solutions to the heat equation. Solutions to Laplace's PDE, which is this thing right here, are called harmonic functions. And these functions are ones that are in the null space of Laplace's operator. Now, if we, as I said before, if we fix the value of u on the boundary of a region, the solution to the so-called boundary value problem, that's the surface that satisfies this PDE and the, those boundary conditions is as flat as possible. So plastic wrap stretched around the boundary is one way to think of it. And as I said before, this model steady state solutions to the heat equation. And if you're curious about this, you want to learn more, I strongly encourage you to look at my videos. I talk about the heat equation both in my ordinary differential equations class as well as my advanced engineering math class. The latter is going to be at a little higher level, and I do a lot more. So I do other coordinate systems and assume more linear algebra knowledge. So take a look at those. Now, what I don't cover in those classes are numerical methods to solve these. And one of those is the finite difference method. So this is a way to solve Laplace's equation numerically that uses a square lattice with some small mesh spacing. Let's call that mesh H. So what we're saying here is that we have, maybe we have some, some, some square region, or maybe, maybe it's not square. We actually know how to do the ones where it's square. But if you have some other shape, maybe we don't know how to solve that. So you can do a numerical method. And what you're basically doing, I, sh I should have done fewer dots, is you are breaking up your region into some into finitely many points. And, and, and then you're going to solve this. Or you're going to find this. Well, you're going to find the solution at some point based on the solution of its neighbors. So. The, the, to figure out what the solution is here, we're going to look at the solution of its four neighbors. Let's call such a point O, and let U0 be the value of U at O, and let's let UW, UE, UN, and US be the values at the neighbors. Now, we can approximate the derivatives with centered differences, 
So UXX, I don't need to go into details about this. It's just basic like Taylor approximations. UXX is approximately UW minus 2U0 plus UE divided by H squared. And UYY is approximately UN minus 2U0 plus US over H squared. So let me actually just draw a picture for, for what this looks like. So, so here is, so U0 is, is the solution. Think of it like the, the height of the function at U0. And then we have four neighbors. And then this is going to be u w um, over here on the right is going to be u e. This is going to be u n and u s. So the the x derivative, if you just you can ignore n and s, um, it's just a second order Taylor approximation. Um, so it's going to be the u w minus two of these plus u plus this, and then for the y direction, it's it's un plus us minus two of two of this. Now, if we take this and we plug this back in, both of these back into Laplace's equation up here, and you solve for u naught, you get a very simple algebraic equation, which tells us that u naught is just the average value of its neighbors. And that should make sense if you take any point somewhere in the middle of this region that the temperature of that point is going to be roughly the average value of the temperature of its four neighbors. In general, what these numerical methods try to do is to solve an inhomogeneous boundary value problem for Laplace's equation. So that's just this PDE, which is homogeneous, but the boundary conditions are going to be some non-zero function. However, before we can do that, we have to understand that these numerical methods work. And one way to do that is to check to see whether they work in the simple case where the boundary is zero. In other words, the think of it like the temperature is zero on the entire boundary. And now in this case, it's easy to think of if you have some region like this and the boundary is zero and you st stick this in a bucket of soap and you pull it up, it's going to be a, a flat surface. And it better be the case that this numerical method is going to give us the same solution in this case. If that's not the case, then there's no way we will be able to apply it for non-zero boundary conditions. So that's the claim. We claim that our homogeneous equation with zero boundary conditions has only the trivial solution using our finite difference method. So I'm not going to give a formal proof, but I'll give a sketch of how this is done. So let's suppose that somewhere in this region, in the interior, there is some point where u achieves its maximum value. So we know that this is going to be impossible. So if, if, the, if this is zero everywhere we, and we you know, take plastic wrap and stretch it out among here, that there's not going to be any local maximum. So let's, so let's suppose that there's, there's some point where the maximum is achieved. I'm going to call this O, o hat. Our goal is to show that the temperature here is going to be in fact, zero, it's the same as the boundary. And then we can do the same thing with the, the minimum. So let's take this point at which u achieves its maximum value. And you know, somewhere here, there's, it's going to have four neighbors. It's going to have four neighbors. And we know that, that, that the temperature there is the average of those four neighbors. So because this is the maximum value, then all of these have to be the same. So if any one of these were, were, if any of its neighbors were cooler, then some of the other neighbors would have to be hotter to make up for it. So because this is the maximum, all five of these have to be the same. And then you can repeat this process. So what we basically have is, is, is we have the, here we have the, the maximum temperature, let me call this T. And then um, all of the neighbors also have to have temperature T, and then we just keep repeating the process. So, so this neighbor up here, um, so this is also the maximum value, and it's the average of its four neighbors. So this, so the temperature at its neighbors have to be T, and we keep going, and eventually we will run into the boundary. And so the function is going to have to be constant. No matter where we go, every single lattice point is going to have that maximum value, 
and that maximum value is going to have to be zero because we will eventually run into the boundary. Finally, let's turn our attention back to the general case where we have Laplace's equation in a region and the boundary is going to be something that's non-zero. So I claim that by the resulting example B, this is also going to have a unique solution. And if you think about what's going on here is we have a, a region and we have a mesh in here. I'm going to be smart and not draw as many points this time. And every single one of these points in here is going to correspond, is going to be described by, or is going to give us an equation like this. The, the temperature is the average temperature of its neighbors. So at the end of the day, what we're doing in this method is we are solving a massive system of equations, one equation for every point. And then when we get in the boundary, or we get near the boundary, it's going to involve these, these fixed temperatures along the boundary that do not change. So this is going to be, in general, a system of the form Tx equals u. It's going to be an inhomogeneous system. And now the homogeneous equation where the boundary was zero is the related equation Tu equals zero and sorry, Tx equals zero. And we just showed that that has only the trivial solution. So by example B, if this has only the trivial solution, this is going to have a unique solution as well. And that's what we want. We want this numerical method, which is any numerical method is wrong, but it's an approximation. It better be the case that it gives us a unique solution because you know we know from just from basic physics that it, if we t if we t build this boundary out of wire and we stick it stick it into a bucket of soap or we stick plastic wrap around it, that not only is the solution going to be as flat as possible, but it, it, there's only going to be one solution. So a numerical method to be robust is going to have to have that basic property as well, and that follows just from the rank nullity theorem. So in summary, we looked at polynomial interpolation, we, which also comes up in numerical analysis a lot. We looked at average values of polynomials. We looked at the method of undetermined coefficients from ODEs, and we looked at numerical solutions to Laplace's equation. And we got very deep results in all of these fields that basically just followed from studying linear maps and the rank nullity theorem. And this hopefully is a convincing argument for why we're doing this over vector spaces instead of over matrices. You know, if we had just done this over matrices with pivot rows and free variables and upper triangular matrices, we, we would have, and double subscripts, we would have still gotten the same results uh, for Rn, but we would have missed this, you know, these powerful ideas and these tools that have so many more implications uh, in other areas of mathematics. Okay, so, uh, what's next? We will pivot a little bit and go to the algebra of linear mapping. So we'll talk about things like endomorphisms, invertibility, similarity, and uh, equivalence relations and projections and commutators. So things that we won't, we won't really come up with too many results next lecture, but we will set the groundwork for things that we will use throughout this class. So stay with us.